and Twitter and YouTube don't give a toss. Radio 2's Jeremy Vine hits out at social media platforms for not banning his online stalker, jailed for five and a half years, from their platforms. It's not sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's almost the opposite. What happened in this case is that you're fired on from all directions. Every time you open your phone, he's there. Every time you turn on your computer, he's there. For more than a decade, the former BBC local radio presenter turned YouTube truther Alex Belfield bombarded a string of people, mostly journalists, with abusive messages online. He was jailed last week for five and a half years after being convicted of a relentless campaign of stalking. Amongst his victims was Jeremy Vine, who endured an onslaught of abuse, personal attacks and lies across Twitter and YouTube over 12 months. In February, YouTube, where Belfield cultivated a fan base of more than 300,000 followers, blocked his ability to make money from the site after he broke its harassment rules. Yet, several of his videos remain online. Now, Jeremy Vine has spoken out about the trauma of his treatment by Belfield and what he sees as a failure of the social media companies to get Belfield off their platforms. He spoke to Newsnight in an exclusive interview and described how online stalking differed to physical stalking. It's not sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's almost the opposite. I had a physical stalker once. I had somebody turn up outside Radio 2 and try and follow me home and stuff. That was a picnic compared to this. Because what happened in this case is that you're fired on from all directions. Every time you open your phone, he's there. Every time you turn on your computer, he's there. And you know that what he's doing is he's adjusting or despoiling your digital self. Now, you may say, well, it doesn't matter. You just come offline. But the fact is that, you know, we live 70, 80, 90 years, but our digital presence goes on forever. And you can see yourself being dismantled. And you can't see it ending. The judge actually said when he sentenced Belfield, you didn't meet or physically approach or watch any of your victims as a traditional stalker might have done. Your methods were, however, just as effective as a way of intimidating your victims and were in many ways much harder to deal with. The danger came from the online traffic, not from the individual. I would have done anything to meet this guy and have a conversation with him face to face. He wouldn't have been threatening. He was probably a coward. But what he wanted to do was create so much hatred against me that someone acted by proxy. I'm absolutely certain that he knows, with 400,000 people watching those videos, that at some point someone is going to take a knife or acid to my home. Or the other thing is, he gets one of his victims to take their own life. We heard about someone trying exactly that in the court case, one of the victims. Two of them described themselves as becoming suicidal. That is not to be taken lightly. I think if the courts hadn't stopped Alex Belfield, somebody would have died. Someone who stalks in person, we imagine to be hiding in the shadows. But what Alex Belfield and his army of followers was doing was in plain sight. Everyone could see it on Twitter and YouTube. It's extraordinary. And I think there's a business model here and this case has broken it, which is great news for everyone. But the original business model was started by Alex Jones in the USA, and it's basically selling massive amounts of misinformation on the basis that often lies are more interesting than truth. He, Alex Jones is the man who said the, the Sandy Hook shooting did not happen. That's right. And was recently sued for libel by the parents of one of the children who was killed. Correct. So you create a market for lies. You drive lies at your audience. They become dependent on your lies. And you, you will victimize people along the way because you're lying about people. Now, Alex Jones was making a lot of money until he got stopped by the courts. And Belfield, I think, might have made a lot as well until he got stopped. Mm -hmm. But it is clearly it's a business model that seems to work, which is that you simply create a market for lies and falsehoods. And you generate anger and then feed off it. And the anger that you create gives you some sort of loyalty from your audience. So you're in an extraordinary poisonous two-way relationship with, with all of these people who will go out eventually and do your bidding. Were you afraid of him? I was afraid of what he could do to my family. I was afraid because you have to think round corners with this stuff. And, you know, we've seen knife attacks on MPs, MPs being killed, people who are prominent being attacked. So 
I'm not trying to give myself undue status here, but I had to think this through. So I can see this YouTube channel is an absolute fountain of hate. He wants that hatred to be so great that someone pays me a visit. And I know he wanted that because he put my home address out. So I had to take it seriously. I've got two teenage daughters. You know, I, I can't be casual about it. So at that point, I was scared for them. How would you describe this experience? What words would you use? I felt broken over it. I tried to stay away from it, but people would say, oh, I saw this thing. And then, of course, they, his followers would come at me. So I'd be blocking like crazy. And again, you know, looking for followers to block, and that's just not healthy. Mm. I think it just took me into a really unhealthy space. It, in a way, it took me into his weird brain. You know, he, he pulls people into this dark orbit that he's in. The online safety bill is going through Parliament. The new Culture Secretary says it's her number one priority. And it promises, amongst many other things, to make it illegal to send a message causing psychological harm amounting to at least serious distress. Had that been in place, would it have made it any easier or speedier for you and others to bring Belfield to court? I'm in two minds here because if I open my Twitter feed, I might be able to describe... To, since you and I have started talking, I might have had 20 tweets that, that satisfy that description, but that doesn't feel criminal to me. That's, that's just your rand... Maybe my, my standards have dropped, but that seems to me like random trolling. What he did was the threshold was so high that it broke existing laws. So I do think it's more than one message, this. I think it's about persistence and about the desire to cause harm over a long period. And he had so much warning that he was getting into criminal territory. He was still broadcasting these disgusting messages when, when he was under investigation by the police. So he obviously didn't really care about the law at all. How have YouTube and Twitter behaved during all of this? I'm amazed at how hard it is to get them to realise. So we went to YouTube and said, come on, you know, what, what's going on with this guy? You can't allow him to just defame. Then we say, OK, there's a libel action now based on that video, that video, that video. They still won't take them down. Eventually, we have to go through a lawyer. They take down individual videos. And then when he's convicted, they demonetize him. But the, half the videos about me are still up there. His technique was to say copy and share. So you'll have someone who takes his video in, in Moscow and hosts it. And, I'll, you know, it'll always be out there. I've got to live with that. But the fact that YouTube hosts this stuff, they have no responsibility. They don't care. They don't give a toss. They don't give a toss. Sorry for my language, but I am disgusted by their lack of values. And Twitter as well. You know, the guy, still, he's in prison and he's still got a Twitter account. What the hell is that about? I don't, I, I don't understand it. With, with somebody like Belfield, the flagging of those broadcasts was continuous, constant, not just by the victims, by other people who were friends of the victims. One person went into the YouTube HQ and, and asked reception if they could do anything about it. So that it's not a mystery to them which of the problem accounts. And they just need to take them down. You know, I, I, Belfield has already put out a, vision, a video from prison saying he's going to be right back up and running. He's got restraining orders now in eight people's cases, but he'll start on other people. And I do think, you know, the one thing you can do is deprive people of, of their platform. Thank you very much for talking to us, Jeremy Vine. Well, YouTube told us our community guidelines prohibit content that threatens individuals, and we have removed several videos for violating these policies. Twitter declined to comment.